Hello there. Welcome to this episode of Force Ghost Conversations. This is your host, Anthony King, and this week I'm going to discuss the second episode from Ahsoka titled Toil and Trouble. Before we get started, I'm inviting you to join the conversation with us. We can be found on Twitter and Hive at Force Ghost Pod. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok just by searching Force Ghost Conversations. Also, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on your listening side of choice. Plus, Force Ghost Conversations is live on Patreon. If you are a fan of the podcast and would like to consider pledging your support, there will be a link in the episode description for you to check out the various tiers offered. And finally, please be sure to check out our T Public store to buy some Force Ghost Conversations merchandise. And without further ado, it's time to gather around the campfire for some Force Ghost Conversations. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back. It is Force Ghost Conversations, your cozy home for deep dive discussions into all things Star Wars, plus Lucasfilm, including Indiana Jones, Willow. We'll get to American Graffiti one day. He's looking at you too, THX, THX 1138. But today we're continuing our Ahsoka Conversations. Before we get into that, for those in the United States, Happy Thanksgiving. I know this episode comes out a few days after the Thanksgiving holiday, so congrats to everybody on a successful Thanksgiving. Uh, I hope I enjoyed my food as well. I'm very excited for the food. So I'm recording this episode in advance, so I'm projecting that I had a good dinner. (laughs) Uh, And then talking to myself in the future, present, past tense. I don't know. It's all confusing and it's interesting at the same time. That's not what you're here for. But thanks again for joining us and making us um a part of your holiday festivities and if you're not in the united states and you don't celebrate uh thanksgiving then just carry on as usual thank you for listening to forest ghost conversations and making us one of if not maybe your only star wars podcast anywho let's talk about ahsoka episode two also before we get into that actually i keep doing these false starts for you all as I noted in last week's episode, this is recorded in advance because of the holiday. I don't want to have to lug around podcast equipment uh, to Pennsylvania back and forth and all that stuff. Don't need to do that. Um, get that on a plane and just mess with all. Who, who, I'm not even fathoming all that stuff. Just letting it go. Anywho, <laughs> this episode was recorded in advance. Therefore, uh, no Cloud City gossip because I don't know the news that will come out in the week that is between the time of this recording and when it actually comes out. So anything, I I also missed it for the week before because I'm cold. I have a cold. You may hear that in my voice just generally as you're going through this. Anything in the last three weeks will be covered in next week's episode news wise. So there's going to be a massive cloud city gossip in a couple weeks. Just bear with me on that one. We're here to talk Ahsoka episode two. Last week, we discussed episode one, Master and Apprentice, which is a great episode. And this is really the part two of episode one. I mean, literally, it is part two of episode one. But these two are kind of like, you can't watch one without the other. It's just, it lands on that cliffhanger that quickly gets resolved right in the front, which, again, I didn't think there was ever a doubt on Sabine not living, right? I think that is a major catalyst of the series is the relationship between Ahsoka and Sabine, which I think in this episode, it's appropriate to talk like Sabine gets trained as a Jedi. Was anyone ever fathoming that as a possibility? I mean, we'll get into that here in a bit. Um, but I, I don't really think that this was ever, ever in doubt, right? That's a main character. It's a fan favorite. It's one that people wanted to see in live action for quite some time. Natasha Liu Bordizo really knocks it out of the park in, and being the character if you ask me you know i think there's some questions as to like do we agree with the character's choices probably not i think that is fair when you look at the course of the of the entire season at this point so uh, you know that that's also a fair choice like feeling as well i know that people in my circles are not feeling so uh on the uh, sabine train right, right now in, in a way um so yeah this is called toil and trouble it is directed by Steph Green, who I believe did some work on the Book of Boba Fett. And obviously written by Dave Filoni. This man's going to touch all these episodes here because Ahsoka is his baby in many ways. It is, uh, and, and with all the characters too introduced in this that are full Filoni, right? I mean, in this episode, you get alone Sabine, Huang, uh, Huyang, um, 
Hera. Chopper 2 is in this episode, which is literally voiced by uh, uh, Dave Filoni. And then uh, we get some other fan favorite characters now, too. Balin Skull, Shin Hadi. Merrick gets an introduction in here, and we all know what he becomes. Or I just remember the discourse being about Merrick, like, well, what is Merrick? Who, <laughs> is he Ezra, right? Is he brainwashed Ezra? Uh, I don't really know what Merrick is to begin with, because when he gets perished uh, in, in episode four, he just kind of uh, has this, he just kind of disintegrates the the life energy force out of him just kind of evaporates out of Merrick, whatever was in his body. So did Merrick really exist? Was he a zombie? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I really have no answer to that one. And I think, uh, well, I'll wait for some book to tell me about it one day. <laughs> um, so just a run through of the episode, obviously Sabine lives there. Ahsoka goes and tracks down, uh, the, the, one of the droids that was still alive, Sabine tries to um, take its memory and find out where it came from, finds out that it's from Corellia. So Ahsoka and Hera go on a trip to Corellia to see the the the, 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 the shipyards, if you will, where they're working on a hyperdrive that's going to be used for the Eye of Scion, which is the ship that they'll eventually take to, on their journey to Perdia. Uh, Perdia? Perdia? Peridia, sorry, um, which is where Thrawn and Ezra are located. And in that, they discover that there are some people within the Corellian shipbuilding system, as well as just generally across the New Republic that are sympathizers to uh, the Empire. And that is where uh, I want to... Uh, and then finally, so I'll, st- I'll go back to that in a second, but finally... They find out that um, this, they were able to get a tracker on the ship because Shin Hadi and uh, uh, Merrick come to kind of oversee that the hyperdrive gets gets uh, finished and and sent on its way properly without any interruptions. And Chopper's able to get a tracker on it, and they find out that it's going to the Denab system, the planet Cetos, and then. Uh, Sabine says, I'm ready to rock, let's roll. And Ahsoka and Sabine head off to uh, Cetos. So, let's talk for a bit about what this episode shares. So from a canon perspective, it shows to me that the New Republic's certainly in a worse state than I might have originally imagined. Really, where my brain goes with that is that they sacrifice. Well, <laughs> they were put in some hard choices. Let's be honest here. A rebellion comes over. It usurps the empire, a massive empire, and tries to reinstill democracy again to a massive galaxy. That's going to be difficult. The Republic became the Empire overnight, yes. But for an Empire to become a Republic overnight again, that means you have to utilize some of the talent that existed prior. And with that, loyalties are questioned. The guy literally says, uh, Min Weaver, that there are people within every aspect of the new republic that had sympathy to the empire at one point in time no as long as you pay them they're fine i think most people would generally agree it's just those people's loyalties can be bought and that's the problem there if the remnants of the empire the imperial remnants out in the galaxy want to pay somebody more then their loyalties shift again or perhaps they never shifted loyalties to begin with and they were just lying. Both of those are in play here. Which is really problematic when you're trying to set up a new government. Now, setting up a new government is not easy by any stretch. I mean, look at the United States. We had the Articles of Confederation and then that foiled out pretty hard. Switch it over to the Constitution. We still have had troubles with that over the years too. Setting up a government is not easy by any stretch, especially when you're trying to do one that is trying to literally be a galactic-wide governing force 
it's hard. <laughs> and you need people that know how to do a job in order to be successful. And you can't necessarily train everybody when you just kind of go into the offices and take over. Logistically, it's tough. I get that they are put into hard positions, my Mothma, Leia, all of them. But this is where the, the First Order breeds, right? We saw in The Mandalorian that they have these rehabilitation centers, right? People that were with the Empire still had some tendencies to lean towards the Empire. They go through this rehabilitation process. On the surface level, it's fine, but underneath it, it's really not. There were problems with that system and that process. And then, because of that, now you're able to have these infiltrations in every sector of the New Republic that they could switch on a dime like that to feed information into the uh, Imperial, for Imperial remnants. This is where the First Order comes from. This is where we're getting the First Order, right? It's not just thrown out in the unknown regions. It's eventually going to lead to these other unknown regions where... <laughs> uh, you know, the first order comes from. And eventually they're, they're viewed not as a threat until they are a threat. And then that's the problem is it's too late. You get the events of the force awakens, you get, uh, um, planets being destroyed. You got star killer base destroying the seat of the government of the new Republic, <laughs> which leads to a whole galactic war. Again, the resistance has to rise up against the first order. You're starting to see what we were told years ago was going to happen because of the the, the Mandalorian. Dave, uh, Dave Filoni and John Favreau were adamant that they said that you will see the seeds of the First Order being planted here in these stories, in this grander Mandoverse. Now, did they think that they'd do Ahsoka at that time? Probably not. But you're really seeing the storytelling come to fruition because of that. I will tell you, though, Corellia looks a lot better under New Republic rule than it did in Solo. <laughs> the sun is shining. Uh, it seems to be more productive, more efficient, less, less, uh, less laborious, less, uh, uh, you know, uh, Madam Pro Proxima is not taking kids off the streets, it doesn't look like. It looks like it's a more healthy, healthy place. <sighs> It's just interesting that you can, when, I'm a fan of history. I don't love it, I will say, but it hurts me when I'm able to see problems happen or like where I can like put the etymology there. It's like, okay, this is where you, you do, you let this go long enough and this is where it breeds to X. You do like, just letting these empath empire sympathizers go in every aspect of their their work while feeding information to them creating you're just leading to the first order and and it hurts because i know that the 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 struggle and the toils that have been that are that lead in the years to come because of these actions here so it's it's a little hard for me um to seeing that the pain, the suffering that the galaxy is going to go through because of choices made today. But that's the, the part of the failures of the New Republic and that hopefully what Ray, Poe, and Finn, and Rose, and all of them do after Rise of Skywalker is to learn from these lessons and to make a new world that is better. <laughs> so we'll see what happens when it comes to all that. The next thing that I wanted to talk about is the fact that there are multiple galaxies. I chatted in last week's episode a bit about the fact that I enjoyed that there were multiple concepts of Force users, right? Shin Hattie and Balin Skull are not Jedi, nor are they Sith. They're mercenaries. But they abide by a very different form of discipline of Force usage. The Bendu exists outside of the Jedi and the Sith. He's in the middle, as he says. The Night Sisters use the Force for various reasons, or you, you know they have their magic, right, which can be construed as the Force. In a way, the you know the what are they? Uh, the the Chiss. Sorry, I, I couldn't remember Thrawn's uh, Thrawn's uh, race, but they have a bit of Force usage up to a certain age. 
Um, that's canon. Go check out the Thrawn books on, on that one. So there isn't a monopoly on the Force. Also, with this show, we've learned that there are multiple galaxies in a galaxy far, far away. Now there are other galaxies far, far away. And why would I ever think in my head that there is only one big, I mean, it got expansive and there's planets and planets and planets, but there could be other star systems and galaxies and solar, like that's where all this, like it's almost, it blows my mind <laughs> in many ways that I was so minimal in my thinking. <laughs> I think it's really cool. The United, like Earth is in the Milky Way galaxy and we know that there are other galaxies out there. Which is, I mean, why would it not pertain to Star Wars too? I always, I mean, it could call it the unknown regions, call it another galaxy, whatever you want to call it, right? Or maybe they're all connected. It's just further away. I mean, it just depends how you, you spin the wheel, right? But there are multiple galaxies and I think that's just such a cool concept. It makes you wonder again, what other worlds are out there? What are other cultures out there? And obviously at the end of this series, you're going to find out that Ahsoka stays on a certain planet and <laughs> we get to learn more about these creatures and cultures outside of this galaxy far, far away, but they also get to learn about us. And this is part about multiculturalism. That is really great. <sighs> I find it cool. It's basically like a home world uh, of the, of the night sisters in a way, the pathway to, to Peridia, you know, Balin's goal says like, these are children's stories in the Jedi temple. Like, but you can imagine like in these days, like in the higher public, they talk about the exploration of the galaxy, the charting of hyperspace lanes, right? The, the storytelling, the myths of this all, someone must've done it. And over time that, that story becomes myth and legend. And that's, you know, spoiler alert we're getting there eventually but you know because the series is out now i can talk about it as much as i want uh, without looking at the without having the full context of everything which you know you should have at this point is that balen skull is looking for that place because he wants to find out the stories uh, of this place is there a power out there right he's looking for the mortis gods and all that type of stuff out there uh so that's why he wants to go out there and all of that but thron's out there and that's why he says this great line in this episode. What happens when we find Thrawn, Shin Hadi asks him, and he's like, for some war, because he's going to come to this galaxy again, and he's going to reunite the Imperial remnants, and that's going to lead to whatever heir to the Empire-esque film that Dave Filoni is doing. Uh, for others, a new beginning, right? The Empire is trying to take over again. That's their restart. And then for them, for us, power, such as you've never dreamed. Because they're going to try and harness something that was only legend, a myth, a fairy tale, folklore. So cool. So cool. I'm glad that we're getting this expansive way. Like Ahsoka is expanding the Star Wars galaxy in ways that we never, at least I never thought I'd see very, very soon here. So the last thing that I want to talk about here is Sabine. She survives, obviously. But she's she questions a lot about what's her role in all this, right? She's ha obviously her and Ahsoka are not on good speaking terms. They have a fractured relationship because of how they handled being a master and apprentice to each other. I didn't think that, you know, <laughs> at the time I was like, oh, so being getting trained to be a Jedi, that's interesting. I didn't think that she would become a Jedi or at least try to become a Jedi. <laughs> I think she was just going to be Sabine the Mandalorian. <laughs> and then that was going to be Ezra's bag was to do that because he exhibited force sensitivity in the way that we typically do when we search for a Jedi. But there's this concept that, again, that the force is in everybody. Kanan talks about it in the episode when he's training her. You just have to be open to it. Everybody has the force, right? Some are more apt to it than others, which is where the midichlorians come into play. But everyone has midichlorians. It's just, you know, the Jedi had a, 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 at the time of the prequels, they had a formula that was like, all right, we can't take in every kid here. <laughs> we have to have some uh, system in place by which we can measure if a kid is quote unquote gifted enough to come to the camp, to, to come to campus, right? So they instituted the, like the midichlorian system. And then Anakin, of course, has uh, you know, more than Master Yoda. He's over 10,000, right? Whatever metric that they figure it out in order to measure it, right? It makes sense. They're a bureaucracy. It's partially why they fail in a way. So let's 
have that discussion another day. But maybe I was stuck in that dogmatic too. <laughs> so that's why I didn't perceive her to be that. And I, I maybe put her in a box, which is wrong of me. It's wrong of me. I'm glad to see that she tried to become a Jedi. It is funny, though, that Huang is it's like your aptitude for the Force would fall short of every Jedi that I've ever come across in my lifetime. And I've seen like 500 years of Jedi come through. You know, it's it's that's funny. <laughs> but I found it interesting. Like it, she's like it's a, it's Ezra's lightsaber. It's not my lightsaber that he was trying to use. And even you know, like. Hu Yang is like, have you been keeping up with your training? Like just because you and Ahsoka had a falling out, like you didn't need to stop working on yourself. Like you have a choice in this matter too. You never indicated that you were a person that wanted to keep this journey going, right? So she had no indication that you wanted to. It, it's a two-way street in a way. Like Ahsoka could have done better. And we'll get to the Ahsoka part because she has her own baggage and all that stuff. But this episode really focuses a bit on the Sabine of it all. Right. It's her 50% of the relationship. Like I said, in the episode one, they're all languishing. But she was languishing in the fact that she didn't think she could do it. Right. She saw a little bit of failure and ran away from it. That's not my lightsaber. That's Ezra's lightsaber. Even healing's like, you've made some modifications to it. It's yours now. <laughs> so it's her choice at the end of the day. Do I go along with Ahsoka to the CDOS system? And eventually she decides, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I made a promise to Ezra, which I think, you know, pushes her along. But at the end of the day, she has to choose to walk a certain path again. Like she didn't have to, which she does in later episodes, kind of be trained a bit more, work on some training work on her her aptitude with the force she could have just said I, i'm done with all that i'm just fighting as a mandalorian now falling back on on my old trainings <laughs> but she 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 doesn't do that she fights through that feeling of failure she's like i'm gonna get back on the horse and do it again she doesn't just say that necessarily but her actions indicate that and what I really think that indicates that is the ritual at the end. Very similar to what Kanan does before he passes when he accepts that he has a different path, a different future, a different fate. <clears throat> so she gets her armor out again. She chops her hair off. A ritual of a before and after. So, sorry, as I'm taking some water, I'm about to cough. <coughs> Still fighting this cold here. I'm, I've also recorded two episodes back to back here. My voice is ready to take a break. But that was basically her path is clear now. She knows what she's doing. Her end of the bargain is, is, is met as far as I'm concerned. Now, Ahsoka, on the other hand, from when we see her with the mural, right? The, the episode ends with them basically doing the same thing that they did in the Re Rebels epilogue, right? She's at the mural. Sabine's at the mural. Ahsoka comes in her white garb and then says, come, we're, we're going off on this adventure. We're going to Purgle Town, if you will. But we get that again. And then this time Ahsoka's wearing gray, which I think indicates that she's regressed. She's the one languishing now. She's not wearing white. She doesn't have a clear path. She isn't sure of herself. There's a lot that Ahsoka needs to work on at this point. And we're going to tackle that in upcoming episodes, of course. So that, of course, finally is my thoughts and discussion on episode two of Ahsoka, Toil and Trouble, which we got a little bit of in every regard. What did you think of this episode? Have you thought, have you changed on it? Did you like that we got them back to back? I think they're kind of needed as a pair set because now they're off on this hero's journey. They're leaving these planets. They're going off to fight the good fight, to go off on this adventure to find Thrawn, hopefully to find Ezra at the same time. What did you think about this episode? Hit us up on all the social channels. You know where to find us. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram. Just search Force Ghost Conversations, and you'll find us there in some capacity. Also, 
If you want to support the show in further ways, you can subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast site of choice, Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, you name it, we're there. Just search for us and you'll find us. If you leave a rating and a review, that helps to expand the show's listenership as we break algorithms too, which is really cool. And if you want to support the show monetarily, you can do that via um, a variety of, of ways. So Patreon is probably the easiest way to do that, where you can find the various tiers uh, available for as little as $1 a month. You can get access to other Force Ghost Conversations goodies. And you can also support uh, the show via merchandise through our Public store, where we have t-shirts, hoodies, pillows, blankets, iPhone cases, literally there's a whole plethora of stuff. And they're running sales all the time for the holiday season now. So if you have a fan of Forest Ghost Conversations in your household and you want to support the show and let them wear their support of the podcast, then go to Public and go do that. So with that, folks, that is all that I had for episode two of Ahsoka. We'll be back next week with episode three. I'm very excited to get on to the next episode because I think they basically fly from here on out. So uh, we'll be back very soon. May the force be with you. Take care.